So welcome to the second week of the Introducing Buddhism course. Just a little reminder that last week we discussed the basic elements of what is Buddhism and why it is different in many ways from other major religions. And we talked about who was the Buddha and the Buddha is a was a person, a man, not a god, born in a luxurious life on the borders between India and Nepal, and who at the age of 29 had a realization that he needed to search for um, a way out of the suffering that he had encountered in the world. And that set him off on a six-year course of seeking the truth, studying with different teachers. And then eventually at the age of 35, he had his great realization, his enlightenment sitting at the foot of under the Bodhi tree. And after that, he spent the rest of his life teaching and giving us the, showing us the way to discover the things that, that he discovered should we choose to follow that way. So what we're going to go on to tonight is some of the core Buddhist teachings. We're going to cover the three signs of being and the three fires. But before I get on to that, I'm just going to suggest some reading. There is a reading sheet in your course materials, but I'm just going to highlight these two books here because actually because I happen to be reading them at the moment, and they're both um, books very closely related to the Buddhist Society. The Buddhist Handbook by John Snelling, who used to be the General Secretary of the Society. That's a, a very good core introductory book to the core Buddhist principles and to the main schools of Buddhism. And on the right here, a book written by our very own president, Desmond Bidolf, covering the teachings of the Buddha and drawing on some of the written records, the Pali Canon and the Sutras. It's a very nice, hardback, attractive little book, um, very easy to read. And you can get both of these from Amazon and they'd be a very good starting point for your reading. So just to touch on some of the things that we covered last week, we talked about some of the terms that I have to use, which are Sanskrit or Pali terms. And the first one that we've come across is um, the term Buddha. So the person, the historical Buddha was born Siddhartha Gautama, and he was became called the Buddha when he achieved his enlightenment. And the word Buddha, a Sanskrit word, means enlightened one, one who is awake, and um, we talk about the historical Buddha, but as you'll hear as we go on through the course, there have been other Buddhas in the past and there will be other Buddhas in the future. So this is a title that refers to someone who has achieved this great awakening. The word that I want to introduce you to tonight is Dharma, because the teachings of the Buddha are called the Buddha Dharma, and the word Dharma originates from uh, the root of the word really um, comes from a word meaning something like to support, to hold. And Dharma refers to really the nature of things, how things are, the way things are. And the Buddha's teachings are, the body of the teachings is called the Buddha Dharma, but really Dharma in the broader sense refers to the actual world as it is, the world in which we live and how we experience things, just the nature of things, the true nature of things, as opposed to the um, slightly deluded version of things that, that we misinterpret as we go through life. So I'm going to start tonight's talk by introducing you to another teaching story, and this is called The Parable of the Raft. This is a very famous Buddhist teaching story. And it refers to, describes a man who finds himself on the shore of a river. And on the, sh on the river, on this side of the river, 
on the banks on this side of the river is great danger, wild animals and treacherous things. And across the sh river on the other shore is safety. But in between him on the dangerous shore and the safe shore, there is a river which is flowing very, very fast. And the Buddha taught this, told this story to his followers. He said, so what he did he was he was to construct a raft. He gathered materials from around him, leaves and planks and logs, and managed to bind together a raft that he could sit upon. And he floated the raft on the river. And then using his hands and feet, he managed to propel himself across the river from the shore of danger to the shore of safety. And then the Buddha asked his monks, said, so monks, what should this man now do with this raft, having constructed it and used it to get across the river? Should he carry it with him? on back or should he lay it down and the monk said no he shouldn't carry it with him he should lay it down and the buddha said and it's the same with my teaching it's for it's a skillful means to get you from a place of danger to a place of safety but once you've done that you lay these teachings down you don't cling to them so that's the point of the story is that we shouldn't be clinging to the Buddha's teachings, we use them as a skillful means to get from where we want to be, from our deluded world of suffering to a place of enlightenment, but then we lay those teachings down and we go on our way. And the other thing I want to say about this story, which strikes me as very important, is that the, the man gets onto the raft and he propels himself across the river using his hands and using his feet. In other words, he makes an effort. He doesn't just sit on the raft and float. Otherwise, he'd be drifting off downstream as fast as the river was flowing. He actually had to put some effort in. And we said that at the end of last week's course, we said you actually have, if you're going to follow a Buddhist path, you actually have to get on and do it. No amount of reading and thinking and pondering will get you where you want to be. You actually need to get on and do the practice. And in the same way, if you want to get over the river, to the place of safety, you actually have to put some effort in and paddle yourself. The raft will carry you, but it will carry you downstream if you don't put some effort in of your own volition. So we're going on to the substance of tonight's talk, which is some core Buddhist concepts. And the first thing we're going to cover tonight is something called the three signs of being also called the three marks of existence. And these are the three characteristics of everything in our experience. And the first these three are linked together inextricably. And the first of them is impermanence or change. Everything is changing, nothing is fixed and permanent. Everything is empty of any any substance, any intrinsic nature, and particularly ourselves are empty of any intrinsic self-nature. And the result of those two signs of being is that the world is an unsatisfactory place, which is difficult for us to live in, in comfort. We are uncomfortable and feel uneasy. And I'm going to cover each of those three signs of being in a little bit more detail now. So let's start with the easy one, impermanence. It hardly needs to be said that nothing in this world is permanent. And this isn't a particularly Buddhist concept. This is a quote from a Greek philosopher, Heraclitus, who said, no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it is not the same river and he is not the same man. No matter what it is, whether it's a mountain, a being, a living thing, Everything is subject to change and decay, and that is just the way things are. You can really, nothing is permanent in our whole existence. So here's a, I think this is a Disney world in China or somewhere which has been abandoned and has fallen into 
decay. But even though we kind of know this, I mean, we know it, we know that everything is changing. We know that we are growing old, we're going to get sick, we're going to die. We actually really strongly resist this. So I've got these lovely flowers here. We love the flowers when they are fresh and smell lovely and look beautiful. And as they start to fade and wither, we start to dislike them and throw them away. And who among us has not felt a sense of resentment that you've gone out and bought this beautiful bunch of flowers, roses or tulips or whatever, and within a few days they're starting to wilt, all their beauty has gone, and we start to feel really quite dissatisfied with them and can't get them out of the house quick enough. So things change. That is their very nature that they will change. But we, because we are deluded, we feel very strongly that things shouldn't change, particularly things we like. They should stay in that beautiful state forever. That's how we would prefer it to be. We ourselves are changing. I've got here pictures of Bridget Bardot as a beautiful young woman. And as still beautiful, but clearly a much older woman, we ourselves are changing. Now, you know this every time you look in the mirror, you can see the new wrinkles, the hair is going gray, the skin is starting to lose its elasticity. But goodness me, don't we resist this? Don't we feel incredibly vexed that we are losing our good looks, we are losing our flexibility, our ability to touch our toes. We make those involuntary little grunts as we sit down and stand up from, or maybe that's just me. You know, old age is creeping up on all of us and we, most of us, fight this tooth and nail, even though we know it is inevitably so that we will age. We fight it because we really, really don't like it. And yet there's another way we can, we can, acknowledge change and impermanence. And I'm using here an example of the beautiful Tibetan, the sand mandalas that Tibetan monks make. You will have seen these, I'm sure. They spend days creating these beautiful mandalas, these beautiful pictures made up of colored grains of sand. And then at the end, they very ritualistically destroy them. This is a picture of the monks actually sweeping those sand grains away, they sweep them all up into a pile and get rid of it. They've created this beautiful thing, spent hours and hours and hours of effort doing it. And then once it served its purpose, the sand is swept away, the picture is destroyed, and that's the end of it. And I ask you, who among us could not would not feel a sense of regret <laughs> as you're sweeping that sand mandala away? because we've made it and it's beautiful and we don't want to get rid of it. But that's part of the practice is to make these things and to destroy them again. So in terms of change, it can be a source of blessing as well as a source of frustration. And I'm going to give you a story which illustrates this. I've called it the story of King Solomon's ring, but it's not necessarily about King Solomon. It refers to a, a very um, a king who wanted to give uh, a gift of great value, I think, to, to his wife, or maybe he wanted to have a gift of great value for himself. So he sent for his, his best jeweler, and he said, make me something beautiful that will make me sad when I'm happy and happy when I'm sad. And the jeweler said, it shall be done. And off he went. And the month passed and no jewel was forthcoming. And so King Solomon sent for the jeweler and said, Is there, have you got anything for me? And he said, yes, I'll have something very soon. And then eventually came before him and he produced this tiny gold ring. And King Solomon looked at him and he thought, are you making fun of me. You've been gone for months, months, and months. And I said to bring me something beautiful that would make me happy when I'm sad and sad when I'm happy. And you bring me this. And the jeweler said, look closely. 
And King Solomon looked very closely and inside the ring was written the words, this too shall pass. And then the king realized that the jeweler had fulfilled the mission and given him something that would make him sad when he was happy and happy when he was sad. This too shall pass. So that's a very important thing, isn't it? That whatever state we're in, whether it's a happy state, a sad state, it will change. And for people who are living through grief and difficulties, the knowledge that it will pass may be helpful for you. Um, but obviously, being Christians and being living in our deluded states, we'd rather not to live in any unhappy state. We want to be happy all the time. But don't forget, the law of impermanence says things will change. If you're happy, eventually your happiness will, the source of your happiness will be lost. If you're sad, the source of your sorrow will go. Things will change. That is the nature of things. The second of the three signs of being is suffering or dukkha. We talked a little bit about this last week. Suffering I teach and the way out of suffering. That was one of the words. Those are the words of the Buddha. Suffering I teach and the way out of suffering. Now, suffering is a very broad term and quite often gets misunderstood. So I'll show you this word cloud. Suffering really covers uh, the, all the elements of life that are unsatisfactory to us. So it encompasses the whole spectrum from pain, grief, despair, right through to that nagging sense of slight sense of annoyance that things aren't quite right or a slight sense of discomfort that you, you don't quite know, you know, what's happening tomorrow. Have you worked it out? That sense of just light disturbance about things, but suffering or discomfort or disease or dissatisfaction is absolutely intrinsic to the world that we live in. And this is partly because things are subject to change that we know that they we can't keep anything. But that sense of nagging dissatisfaction, discomfort is pervasive. And this is what leads many people actually into a religious practice, that sense that something is not quite right. There is another way, surely, can I get away from this sense that the world isn't quite right, it's not suiting me. That does actually set us off on our quest towards a religious journey, uh, on a religious pathway. So um, it, it, it's, it's a very important aspect of, of existence. The Buddha defined suffering or dukkha. He said birth is dukkha, aging is dukkha, death is dukkha, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair are dukkha. Association with the unbeloved is dukkha, separation from the loved is dukkha, not getting what is wanted is dukkha. So that pretty much encapsulates everything in our existence, doesn't it, that, that is unsatisfactory about the way we live. The third of the three signs of being, which is probably a little bit more difficult to grasp initially, is the sense that there is nothing intrinsic, there is no intrinsic sense, there's no intrinsic self. In other words, if I'm impermanent, if I'm aging and decaying, just like everything else around me, where is the permanent me, the intrinsic meanness of me? There is no such thing. And if you are looking in meditation to see where is this self, where is this intrinsic I, it is actually very difficult to find. And yet it is such a strong illusion that there is a me, that I'm sitting here in my skin and there is a somebody inside, a mannequin, a self, a soul, if you like, directing operations. And that person, that thing, that mannequin, when you look for it, you can't actually find it. But the problem is that the idea that there is such a thing, that I'm separate from you, I am different from you, leads to me thinking that there's an, an, that not only is there an I, there's also a me and there's a mine, and I'm going to protect the I, the me and the mine from the you and the yours. And this causes a great deal of dis, disharmony and suffering in its own right because we are so strongly protective of this notion of ourselves 
my own sense of self, my independence and my separateness from you, that we're prepared to um, fight to the bitter end to, to, um, pr to um, protect that. And yet it is an illusion, but it is a very, very powerful illusion. I'm going to give you some thoughts about how you might think about this. So this is my cartoon of people going speed dating. I feel none of you will probably ever have had to do speed dating, but essentially you, you sit down with someone, a complete stranger, for two minutes and you tell them everything about yourself in the hopes that somehow you know, you're going to get a connection going and that might lead to a relationship and a date. But I'm going to ask you to think, what could you say about yourself that would encapsulate that essential you-ness that you feel is such a powerful part of your personality? You could say, you could describe your, your height. You could say, I'm, well, what would I say? I'm five foot four, I'm 59. I've got blonde hair and blue eyes. Um, I work as a doctor. I like um, going to the theatre and I like tea and I prefer coffee. You know, all of these things that I'm describing, none of that is the intrinsic me. These are just things that are also subject to change. I'm not actually five foot four. I used to be. I think I'm five foot three now. I am 59, but a few weeks ago I was only 58. The hair is now grey. Um, I won't be a doctor forever. I will eventually retire. My likes and dislikes change. What could I say in two minutes that would make that other person really know the me that I feel is there to be known? Nothing. And the deeper you dig into that sense of self, that sense of I, you find there's really nothing there that you can grab a hold of. It's all ephemeral. It's all changing. And yet that makes us feel very uncomfortable when that's put up in front of us, that there is no fixed central me in this world. It makes us feel uneasy because we feel there must be, there must be. Here's a picture. It's actually little colored squares on a, on a blue background. And yet you can see someone there, can't you? And you know who that is. That sense that there is somebody there is very, very strong. You can't just wish it away. Here's another optical illusion. You will all be seeing a white triangle in the foreground of this picture. There is no white triangle. It's an optical illusion. As you can see, if you look at it carefully, it's a picture made up of, uh, of different shapes. But it, there's no thing, nothing you can do to not see that white triangle. It's just as bare, isn't it? But in the same way, you can't, by sheer act of will, say, yes, there is no intrinsic I, no self, no me. You have to experience it through Buddhist through practice. You can't just say, that's it, no I, finish with that, because it's very, very powerful. It's very, very strong. So if we are not made up of, if there's no ghost in the machine, if you like, there's nobody inhabiting this body, there's no I, there's no soul, then what are we? And this is brings on to the next part of the talk. The Buddha said, he used an analogy of a cart. So here is a very nice picture of a cart with Chinese um, descriptions on it. If you take this cart apart and dismantle the wheels, the axle, take off the seat, the drawbar, etc., and lay all of those pieces out on the floor, where will the cart be? And this is the same with ourselves, that we are made up of components, and once those components are taken apart, that sense of I, that person, that thing that we are so convinced is there, disappears, it dissolves, just as the cart is only a construct of all of these things that have come together at that point in time. Once you start taking those bits and pieces away, cart disappears. And just as when my own component parts disappear, I will disappear too. So what are my component parts? So this brings us on to the next part of the talk, which is the five aggregates or scandars. So in, in the word scandar is a Sanskrit word, and it derives from the word, a word that means aggregate or heap. 
I want you to think of those little piles of spices that you will see laid out in Indian markets. So in Buddhist um, teaching, we are compo composed of five separate elements called skandhas, and this is what they are. There's the form, rupa, sensation, vedana, consciousness, vijnana, perception, sam samjna, and mental formation, samskara. So what those are is the form, which is the physical world as we experience it via our six senses. I'll come back to the six senses in a moment. So my body, my uh, sense organs, the table that I'm feeling now, this is all form. When I come into contact with something in the outside world, when my eye sees something, when my something touches me when I feel a sensation, that sensation, that experience is the sensation, that's Vedana, and that comes up into my consciousness. I have awareness of that contact, and then there will be a perception, a recognition of the thing that I'm experiencing, the thing that I'm sensing. I recognize it, I label it, I see it as, let's say, a tree, a table, coldness, I recognize those things. And then there are mental formations. In other words, the thought processes that then arise from that contact and recognition and then may drive action, will drive action forward. So I'm going to talk briefly about the six senses and I'm going to give you an idea about how that all fits together in, um, the, in the context of an experience. So there are six senses. We're all familiar with the five senses, the seeing, smelling, tasting, touching, and hearing. In Buddhism, the mind and mental objects, thoughts in other words, is the sixth sense. So the mind is another sense. So we can interact with things in the outside world, the nose smells things, the eye sees things, the ear hears things, but the mind thinks things, and that's another interaction that comes into consciousness and fits in with, this, with the, the five skandhas that way. So here's an example. There's the object, rupa, the thing that I'm seeing. In this case, it might be a flower. There is the perception. So the light from the flower hitting, in this case, the retina and sending signals through my optic nerve. There is the, that sensation, like coming together, the contact between the eye and the object that is being seen. That is vedana, that sensation. And then I get this recognition, Vijnana, that this is a flower. And then I start thinking about flowers that I've seen in the past. This is a nice flower. This is a pink flower. This isn't quite as attractive as the flower that we had last week, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the mental formula formations. So let me give you another example from my own experience. So. A few summers ago, I was walking in the Norfolk Broads, and um, I don't know if any of you know the Norfolk Broads, these big patches of um, big areas of water in East Norfolk. And in the summer, they have mosquitoes there the size of baby birds, actually horrible big mosquitoes. But I'm walking through the Broads. It's a lovely sunny day, and we stop to have a look into the distance. And suddenly, I can sense... I feel pain on my, my leg. I look down. There is, so there is the, the sensation, the pain. I recognize that there's something I've sensed and it's unpleasant. It's a painful thing. So I look and I see the unmistakable shape you can see here of a mosquito. I immediately recognize that is a mosquito. And then that sends off a whole cascade of worry in my mind. First of all, I'm very allergic to mosquito bites. So I know now there's going to be a big bump on my leg, it's going to be itchy and painful, I'm going to be scratching for several days. And worse than that, I'm now at cross with the person who chose this walk in the first place, my husband, who didn't say put some mosquito repellent on, and I'm angry with him. And now suddenly we have a big seething resentment going on that's going to last for the rest of the walk because I'm cross with him. So that's how that whole picture might fit together with one simple interaction between me and a mosquito. There is actually no need for an eye in all of that. There is simply the mosquito contacting my leg, the painful sensation, 
and then the thoughts that flowed once I recognized what was happening to me. And in the same way that you take away the cart, the elements of the cart, the sense of cart disappears, you can start picking apart those different um, those different scanners, the sensation, the perception, etc., and the whole edifice, the structure that I've turned into me and my feeling about mosquitoes starts to dissolve away. So those are the three signs of being and the five scanders. I'm now moving on to the second part of the talk, which is talk about the three fires. You will see here um, a little image of three animals chasing each other. There's a crawl, a snake and a boar, and those represent the three fires. So they're called the three fires or the three passions, or sometimes they're called the three poisons. The Buddha spoke of these in a particular sermon called the fire sermon. The, the house, in other words, we ourselves, the house is on fire. The house is burning with the fires of wanting, hating and delusion. There is no abiding in such a house. So the Buddha described very clearly how these passions, these fires drive us. This is really one of the things that is the elements on that dangerous shore, that burning house that we're living in because the house is burning with these three fires. So what are these three fires that are burning us up? So the first of the fires is greed, desire, or attachment. And that is represented in this diagram by the cockerel, which is pecking in the dust, looking for seeds. And then there is the, fire, the second fire, the fire of hatred or aversion, which is the snake, which is going around hissing in an angry way. And then finally, the fire of delusional ignorance, which is represented here by the boar, which is truffling around in the dirt, throwing the dust up into its eyes and um, covering itself with dirt and clouding its vision. So we'll come on to these three fires in a minute, but it's important to see that in this diagram, which we will come back to it in a future talk, it sits in the center of the wheel of life. These three animals, these three fires are chasing each other around. So desire drives hatred, drives delusion, and so it goes on, they go round and round and round in this little wheel. So what are they? Let's talk about the first one, which is greed or wanting or desire or attachment. So we are all subject to this. What do we want? Well, on the superficially, we want nice things that make us our lives more comfortable. We might want money relationship, we might want fame and recognition, family. There are all sorts of things that we want. And we, because we live in this world of delusion, we think we can only be happy when we achieve these things. We can't imagine life being happy unless we achieve that thing that we're, we're looking for. Now, these are obviously very gross things, and you might say, oh, I don't want any of those things. I'm not actually a greedy person. But there are other things we want which drive us forward, and these are probably a little bit more palatable. We might want to be, to be at peace. We might want peace for the world. We might want to have respect from other people. We might want to be, have pleasure. We might want money, power. There are lots of things that we are wanting. And because we want these things and they are propelling us forward, um, we can't be satisfied and relaxed with what we have because no sooner have you got the thing that you want, you want the next thing. It's not good enough. You know, as soon as you've got that new car, you think, well, I'll be happy now. I've got the new car. And then within a few days, the car's boring or someone scratched it. It's not interesting anymore. And you want the next thing, and so it goes on and on and on. You can never be satisfied because your need to acquire material things will never satisfy you because this is not where the route away from Dukkha sits in acquisition of material things, even if those things are, are 
good things, you know, world peace, harmony, respect. These are not going to make you happy in the long run. Sometimes we want things that are intrinsically good, but we want them in a, in a bad way. Now, I don't know if you will remember, this is some years ago now, but there was a, a child called Charlie Gard who was um, at Great Ormond Street, and it was a very tragic story. Charlie was born with a, with a terrible um, genetic defect that meant he was not going to live really beyond the first year of life. It was an incurable illness. But his parents wanted um, um, a very expensive experimental, experimental treatment, which he'd have to go to America to, um, to get. The Great Ormond Street staff said he's not stable enough to move. People, these are the people, people piled in on Great Ormond Street because they wanted Charlie to live. They wanted Charlie to have this chance. They wanted it so badly. And it was a good thing they wanted. Obviously, they wanted this child to live, but they, their, their wanting spilled over into hatred so quickly. The Great Ormond Street staff had death threats and couldn't leave the hospital. It was a really terrible time for all concerned. So this shows how you can want something, even a good thing, but that can quickly turn into a difficult and unpleasant situation for everyone. So wanting things is, and really passionately wanting things, will actually lead to uh, suffering. From a Buddhist perspective, there are really four things that we want or want to cling to. So not just wanting to get, but wanting to keep once you have it. So there's clinging to sensual pleasures. We talked about that a short ago, money, fame, wealth a good relationship, a nice car. So clinging to sensual pleasures, wanting those things. Number two, clinging to views, holding on to my opinions. I have very strong opinions about most things in life. And I feel really annoyed if you don't share my opinions and if you argue with them, even if my opinions are sound things. So look at animal rights activists invading the pitch, invading the race course at Aintree and causing so much harm, they wanted something that was good. Their opinions were very strongly held, but they went about it in, in, in the wrong way. Another thing we fall into the trap of, particularly as we go into a, a religious practice, even a Buddhist practice, is clinging to the rules, rituals, and observance and observances, rites and rituals. This is how I do my practice. This is what type of meditation I must do. I'm going to wear these particular clothes. I'm going to eat this type of food. There'll be no more chocolate biscuits, just vegan food from now on. And I light the candles and I burn this incense. And this is how my Buddhist practice is. And I can't waver from it. So I do my meditation at six o'clock in the evening. If you've come around to see me, bring me cakes, and I haven't seen you for a long time, and it's six o'clock, and I say, no, go away. I'm meditating that's not really right is it i'm clinging so tightly to my ritual observance of my practice that i've, I've slipped the wrong side of it and, and and this isn't now unskillful and then finally clinging to that sense of self clinging to that strong view that i am yes everything else around me is subject to change and decay but i myself in the middle of all of this it's like a sovereign and uh, it doesn't affect me. So clinging to that self itself is another of the four clingings that, that we, or attachments that we, we um, think about in Buddhism. So the other side of liking and wanting an attachment is hatred or aversion or just wanting rid of things. So there are things we dislike things we want less of, things that we don't want to have in our lives. And uh, this is really obviously the flip side of, of wanting an attachment is hatred and aversion. And this is starts off very early in life. We have very strong likes and dislikes really from the beginning of, of our consciousness, don't we? Um, there's a difference between having a preference. You know, I might prefer tea or I might prefer coffee. 
um, that's fine. You can have a preference. But getting really annoyed if someone has given you tea when you wanted coffee and getting very angry about it is pushing that uh, preference towards a strong like a strong dislike, and that is leading into an unskillful means. So a preference is fine, but a preference that becomes an absolute dislike and aversion to something. I will not eat meat. I will not, you know, I will not have this person in my house, your views on, you voted in a different way from me. I don't want to speak to you. This is, this is inappropriate. As well as disliking things, they're simply just not wanting to engage in that. So another way of expressing um, hatred or aversion is just simply to disengage from the situation, saying, I'm not interested. Just I'm just going to stay here and get on in my own life. I don't want to engage with anybody. This is another unskillful way of going about going about life. And then, of course, things can get out of hand. Um, so football fans, what could be more enjoyable than a sporting game between two sides? You will know as well as I do that sports can very quickly turn into aggression and very soon turn into violence. And football fans have literally killed each other in the past. What is this about? This is people who are supporting the blue team versus the red team or the red people in the red shirts versus the blue shirts. And yet the fact that you support the red shirt and I prefer the blue shirts is going to make me so angry that I'm going to hurt you, I'm going to threaten you, I might even hit you, I might even kill you. What is that about? This is human nature. We're so driven by tribalism, by our attachments to what is I, me, and mine, and my aversion to what is you and yours, and the need to protect I, me, and mine from what's you and yours. That is one of the, the fires. And then finally, delusion or ignorance. I've shown this as a picture looking through a, a window. Um, the window is dirty. We cannot see the world as it really is because our views are so clouded by the fires of ignorance, of attachment, of aversion. We cannot see the way things are. We will not accept impermanence. We will not accept that there is um, that there is no I. We absolutely won't have it. We cling to the way the world seems to be to us, and that is a deluded way of thinking. So we can't see clearly unless we start clearing away those misguided ways of seeing things. So the world is out there, just as even on a cloudy day, the sun is still in the sky. Once the clouds clear, there is the sun, sun still there behind the clouds. In the same way, if we can clear away these misguided ways of thinking, this reliance on that sense of self, this need to like and dislike to pick and choose, we could actually start to see things clearly. But that involves actually clearing that glass, wiping away the dirt of, of wrong thinking that's accumulated over the years. And that's really what the Buddhist practice is trying to enable us to do, is to clear the glass so that we can actually see things clearly, see the world as it really is, rather than see it through our deluded, eye-biased sense of, of, of how things look. Delusion. Have a seat, Kermit. What I'm about to tell you might come as a big shock. We have this very strong view on how things are and we don't want to see things the way they actually are. So starting in your Buddhist practice often is quite a big shock for us because as you start doing your meditation and doing your Buddhist practice, people come and say, do you know, I'm getting worse. I thought I was, you know, I'm more irritated. I'm more irritable. I'm more angry. I'm more my temper is shorter. I just, it's making me a worse person than I was before. The truth is you always were that person. You just never had time to stop and look. So once you start the Buddhist practice, you often think, 
I'm actually getting worse. You go to your teacher and say, I'm more irritated, I'm more angry, I'm, my temper is so short now. It's, and the teacher almost invariably says, good, because or what this, what it's showing is you're actually seeing things clearly for the first time. You're starting to see things how they really are. And what we're really seeing then is this hatred, aversion, um, clinging to wrong view, which up until this point has been completely, we've been oblivious to it. So those are the three fires, greed, hatred, and ignorance. They drive each other around. It is ignorance that drives greed and hatred, and that piles on more delusion, more ignorance. And we will see these little animals again when we cover the wheel of life in, in a future talk. Fortunately, the Buddha, like a good doctor, didn't say, well, here's the disease, suffering, and um, you're stuck with it. He said, there is suffering, suffering I teach, but he also said, and the way out of suffering. So what the Buddha told us is, Yes, this is the way the world is. We have wrong views and we suffer as a result of that. But there is another way. And he showed us the way to get to that point, an end to suffering. He said there is, monks, an unbecome, an unmade, an uncompounded. Therefore, there is an escape from the born, the become, the compounded. In other words, there is an escape from the passions that those fires can be gentled and can ultimately be extinguished. The word nirvana is again, it's a Sanskrit word. And it, the root of the word has the connotation of blowing out, like blowing out a candle, extinguishing those fires that are driving us towards more and more suffering and making our life so difficult. There is a way away from that to the world where we can see things clearly and that place where we can live in harmony with life as it really is, as opposed to being at odds with the world the way we see it, that is called nirvana. Now, I can't describe nirvana to you because it's an experiential thing, not something that you can learn. It would be like trying to describe the color red to someone who's colorblind, it would be impossible to do. This is just something that we have to work towards in our own practice, the idea that there is an end to suffering, there is an end to this mad cycle round and round that wheel with these three fires chasing each other. And that is a world where we can live in harmony, seeing things as they really are. The passions are gentled and extinguished and we can finally be comfortable, and that is nirvana, and that's what the Buddhist practice is leading us towards. Now, I said that there would be homework, and there will be homework. So tonight, I'm going to give you your first homework exercise, and it's very, very easy. It's not very easy, actually. I lied. It's actually quite difficult, but you're going to hopefully have a go at it. It's very, very simple, though. I would like you to choose a bedtime, a time for going to bed, and stick to it for the coming week. Now, I don't mind what time it is you must choose. It could be 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, morning. I don't mind, but you've got to stick to it for the week and just see what happens see what happens. Okay, that's the end of tonight's talk. I'm going to stop sharing slides and we have some time for questions. So let me just see what's happened in the chat here. Sorry to be late. No problem, Heidi. Are there any questions? You're all stunned into silence. Ah, some hands are up. 
Oh, they have unmute. Yes. We right. Harry, you Can have you... to unmute if you are want to ask question. Yeah, no, I was just wait. There were two of us. I was just waiting to see which person was going to be chosen. But I, I can kick off. I'm I'm going to choose you, Harry. You go first. I Very saw your hand. Um, just a question on um on greed. So, it could it also be translated attachment or desire? Like, is it is it? Yeah. What you're describing it. Yeah. It, it, so it's greed. Is would I think would I'm going to think of it as attachment to desire. You can or, think of greed, clinging, attachment, desire, wanting. These are all synonyms for the same thing. You're right. Greed does sound quite gross, but a simple wanting things or wanting to hang on to things, clinging to things, that's all within that concept of that particular fire. Yes. So greed, attachment, clinging, wanting, desire. These are all the same thing, basically, and the same thing. Cool, but I think I'll, I'll privately translate it as clinging, just that one makes you, it easier for me, because, yeah, otherwise it's positive yes. things as well. Um, and that's really helpful well, when you explained it could be positive things as well that you also cling to, because I wouldn't consider those yes. greedy, but, yeah, that, that's very helpful. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Evie, I think you were next. Thank you. Um, at the beginning, you were, there was... Uh, sorry, I didn't write it down. There was about laying something, putting something down... Was it the second yes. slide? It? it was oh, the, can... the, the, the raft, the Buddha's raft, the parable of the raft. Could you just give us an example yes. of that? Well, well, when we talked about clinging to rites and rituals, so everything the Buddha taught us, and we're going to go in next week to the specifics of what he taught, the Four Noble Truths and then the Noble Eightfold Path, etc., these are skillful means to get from where we are now, a world of suffering, to where we want to be, which is nirvana, the world where suffering, there is no suffering, we see things as they are, we're living in harmony with things as they are. Every aspect of the Buddha's path was a, is simply a means to get from where we are now to there. But what he said was, don't hang on to it then, carrying that raft around on your back as you go along the next shore because it's of no use to you anymore. And what he meant was don't cling to these things because that is also a form of clinging. You can be clinging to, as we said, you know, bad things, money, fame, etc. Or you can be clinging to your habits, your Buddhist practice, your worldview, these things also need to be laid down. At the end, when you have reached the end of the path, everything really has to be laid down. You can't cling to anything, even the Buddha's teachings. He said these are simply a vehicle to get you from where we are now to where you want to be. But don't cling to them once you've reached that point. You let them go. So we don't want to cling to the rites and rituals. We don't want to cling to any aspect of the Buddha's teachings. We use it, and then we let it go. We lay it down. So lay it down. Is that like... Teach somebody else? With, or I'm not quite sure what the actual term means in, in, a, well, in, a, in a useful sense. Really? Let go, let go. You can let it go. If you have experienced something, you've used thing, and it's reached the end of its useful time, you let it go. There's nothing you need to carry with you on and on and on once it's finished its purpose. And that includes the Buddha's teachings. Okay. So let it go rather than hanging on to it. Now, you'll have to wait till you get to that far shore into Nirvana to see what that means. And spoiler alert, I haven't been there. So <laughs> I'm telling you a roadmap, but I've not actually got there myself. But nothing is to be clung to because that then becomes a further hindrance if you are then hanging on to your teachings, onto your beliefs, onto your Buddhist practice that then becomes ultimately unhelpful because it is clinging and it perpetuates that attachment. 
So you have to let that go, even though it's the Buddha's teachings, you have to let that go as well. Okay. Thank you. Now we have some more questions. Can you clarify what is meant by delusion? Yes, it's a basically an eye-biased way of seeing things. I am so, so um, trapped in this delusion that there is an I and a me and a mine, and that up in my head, there is a little homunculus sitting here directing things, that that leads me to think that my opinions are important, my possessions should be belong to me and me alone, the parking space about my house is mine and no one else can park in it. That very strong sense of I and everything that belongs to me that is separate from you and what belongs to you and I'm going to defend it, that is part of the big delusion. But it's, it is the sense of I which is driving that. So we have an I-biased way of seeing the world, an ego-biased, selfish way of seeing the world, which we need to work on and slowly overcome through the Buddhist practice to see things clearly. So delusion, in my mind, ignorance, not seeing things clearly, mainly seeing things through this greedy, egoistical, I-biased view, which, of course, is very strong in all of us because that's the way we've, we've spent most of our lives. Um, let me see what's the next question. On greed, I suppose it's more meant as greed and desire for things beyond what one needs rather than wanting or desire in general. To want or desire is okay as long as it is a reasonable desire. Well, I think there's liking and disliking and having preferences is one thing. But once that preference becomes very strong and starts to spill over in towards attachment and clinging, then it's gone too far. So you can want things, um, but so we, we need, there are certain things we need. We need food, we need to be warm, we need shelter. We don't need very much beyond that but it's clinging to things that you have and not wanting other people to have them, not wanting to lose them, clinging to things that are inevitably going to be taken from you through ill health, through age, etc. clinging to those things. It may be good things. I may be clinging to the fact that I used to be able to run marathons. You know, there was nothing intrinsically wrong with being able to run a marathon. I can't now for all sorts of reasons. But if I was to feel a sense of bitter anger because I can't run a marathon anymore, then that would be clinging and that would be causing myself to suffer. Those days have passed. I've let that go. That's something I did. And it's in the past now. I've moved on from that. I'm not clinging to it. So it's a more subtle than simply wanting gross sensual things, wanting money and wealth and fame. Wanting things not to change is also attachment. Wanting to keep my youth, my athletic skills, whatever it is, my intellect clinging to that. You know, as I'm getting older, you get more forgetful. You're not as sharp at, you know, doing the crossword. If I start clinging to that, then that will make me unhappy as well. So you have to accept that everything is sub subject to change and learn to graciously let go of things rather than fighting and raging against it because it is change is inevitable. Admin question. I think there is a link to the recording on the website, but if there isn't, there will be. Um, attachment to good things. I've witnessed people working on gender equality, social justice, decolonization. They are rightful battles, but they end up creating a system of oppression because their actions then mesh with poisons. Yeah, absolutely correct. You can want something that's a very fine thing. You want an end to poverty, world peace, etc. But once you start pushing that and driving that agenda forward, and trying to force other people to come around to your views, you start, if you're not causing harm to others, you're at the very least causing harm to yourself. 
So yes, even the most wonderful things in the world that you're desiring, if you're desiring it and fighting for it, it can be harmful. So people, as you saw with the Charlie Gard example, those people were fighting for something very laudable on the face of it for a child to be able to have a chance to live. But it was a, a wrong way of doing it. They were harming themselves. They were harming the staff. They were harming the public perception through this very, very angry, excited way of, of trying to achieve their aim. So, yes, the, po the poisons, greed, attachment, hatred, aversion can be centered around very, what seems on the face of it, very reasonable desires or dislikes. But if it gets too, too much, too strong, too much eye in there, it, it is a poison and um, unskillful. Last question, what is meant by calling yourself a Buddhist? Well, anybody can call themselves a Buddhist. Um, following the Buddha's way, and don't forget, this is just a way. The Buddha didn't say this is the way. There are many ways of following this type of practice and this type of, um, you know, the principles the Buddha taught. You'll find elements that are common to, to many other religions and many other philosophies. Um, but if we follow the, what the Buddha taught and have respect for the Buddha and um, you know, we're trying to follow the steps that he, the path he laid out for us. I think we're entitled to call ourselves a Buddhist. There are some schools of Buddhism where you have to do certain rituals to say I'm a Buddhist, take refuges and things like that. But I think it's very straightforward. If you're following the Buddhist path, you can call yourself a Buddhist. Right, it's two minutes past, so I'm going to call the meeting to a close. I will send my slides through to Odin so they'll appear in your course material and also uh, the teaching parables I gave this evening. They will also be there as well. And then next week, I think we're going on to the Four Noble Truths. So look forward to seeing you all then. Okay, good night. <laughs>